Okay, cool. Thanks everybody for being here. Yeah, like Sasha and Mike already mentioned, I'm Lucas and I'm here to present our work on uh, Machete, which is our new uh, mixed input gem kernel in the LLM that's used on Hopper GPUs for weight only quantization. So I don't know exactly the background of the entire audience, so I'm going to go over some kind of GPU basics to make sure that we're on the same page. So I apologize if this is a repetition for some of you. Uh, I think it's always nice to go over the fundamentals. Uh, so this is what we're here to talk about today. This is the H100 GPU. And in the middle there, we have the big die where I'll kind of magic have these. And so if we look at kind of a more pictorial representation of, of what's on this actual die and what this die looks like, we can see that there's a lot of, a lot of repeated functional blocks here. Zoom in on one of these functional blocks, we can see there's a few components here that we kind of really care about. So the first one is these uh, memory controllers uh, here on the left side. These reach out to the off-chip memory, the HPM memory. This is the gigabytes and megabytes of memory that is on the GPU, the H100, uh, with that high bandwidth memory bus in between that that brings the, mem uh, the data on chip. And here we have a shared L2 cache on chip that's shared across all of the processing cores. Um, and this is much, much smaller than the HPM memory, but um, still fairly large. It's about 50 megabytes on the H100. And then finally here, we have our streaming multiprocessor. And this is like one core on the GPU that does all the computation. And basically, if you're familiar with GPU programming, we have like a thread block, which is a kind of a unit of compute that gets allocated to the center directly. And so very, very, very brief overview of like GPU program. Basically, your program is set up as a grid of thread blocks. And the thread blocks are what runs on the SM. And this is kind of where what the executed piece of your code. And then that's just repeated many, many times, all working on kind of different portions of the game. And then each thread block is further decomposed into warps. So if you hear me using the term thread blocks and warps, that's kind of a hierarchy. Thread block running on the SM, and then there's multiple warps inside of it. So we can also uh, get a slightly nicer pictorial view here, where we have, again, our VRAM, uh, the, uh, the offset VRAM, our L2 cache, as well as our SMs. And so then if we zoom in a little bit closer on these SMs or streaming multiprocessors, we'll see that inside of them, we have further layers of, of memory hierarchy. Here we have shared memory, which exists inside of the SM, and is very high speed uh, and is directly accessible. Um, and then we have the register file. This is the fastest memory, and this is where all your, basically all your data needs to end up eventually in order to be actually computed on. Uh, and then beside the register file, we have tensor cores, which is, the main focus of, of GPUs these days, this is where the bulk of the compute on a GPU comes from, is these tensor cores. So the goal is always to try to keep these fed. You want to keep these tensor cores going as much as you can all the time. Uh, and then you have CUDA cores, uh, which were, is where integer math and uh, just standard scalar floating point math happens. Uh, so you use this for address calculations. This is all the other stuff you kind of have to do in the GPU. And this is where the compute kind of used to happen before the introduction. And so here, that gives us our final full memory hierarchy for a H100 GPU. And so here, I've kind of exploded out and, and shared some of the bandwidth between each of these layers. So from VRAM up to L2, we have an H100, about 3.35 terabytes per second. And from L2 to shared memory, it's much faster, 12 terabytes per second. And then from shared memory up into registers, we have like a whopping 33 terabytes per second. However, since these are on an SM, these are kind of repeated. So realistically, inside of an SM, you only have about 250 gigabytes. SM. In aggregate across the entire GPU. That's kind of imagine this is this is what typically bottlenecks most kernels is this VRAM to the L2 cache. This is where what we typically want to optimize around because it is the lowest bandwidth, it is uh, the highest latency. This is this is uh, what can really bottleneck kernels. So then also stepping back a little bit, we're just gonna do a quick kind of brief overview of all the like leaders and matrix multiplication. Uh, so the bulk of the time in LN inference is spent in some form of matrix multiplication um, in the linear layers on in particular. And this is just an example of the, of the linear layer. So here we have our input activations X getting multiplied by our weights W, uh, resulting in output activations Y. And we can label some of these dimensions. So the, the rows of Y is our batch size, our sequence length, and in kind of gem terminology, we'll usually refer to this as M. And then our columns of Y is our output features, uh, and this we'll usually refer to as N, I'm naming. And then uh, our in features is the uh, columns of our X or the overalls of our W. So with these labels, we can kind of compute some properties of this problem that we want to, this matrix multiplication that we want to compute. One thing we do compute is 
how many flops it's going to take to actually like fully compute this matrix multiplication and also the total bytes it would take to store y x and w in vram it's going to the number of bytes can also be used as like a lower bound for how long it would take to move the, that data from VRAM into the L2 cache and all the way up to kind of the registers, we can kind of use that number. This is like a loose lower bound when you get into tiling and stuff. There's, there's, there's tighter lower bounds, but this kind of works for our purposes. So if we give these some explicit numbers, say M is 2048, K is 8192, and N is 192, or, and, and we know some properties of the image 100. We know how many faults per second it can compute. We know how many bytes per second from VRAM to L2, which is our main bottleneck, that's the one we're going to optimize it around. Then we can uh, compute the total flops and the problem, combine that with the data for the H100, and we can kind of compute lower bounds in terms of time that it would take to solve this problem. In this case, we could see that the compute we're running through all those flops is the bottleneck here because we have 139 microseconds, and that's the highest lower bound, so this is most likely what's going to cause uh, the bottleneck. But during inference, we end up dealing with slightly different shapes. Uh, so we might our batch size might go down. They were doing decodes. So there's only one token per item in the batch, so we went batch size 32. Um, and so your shape kind of changes here a little bit. In this case, your number of flops and your number of bytes also changes. And now all of a sudden, the compute is very, very fast at only 2.2 microseconds, but the data movement is very slow at 37 months. And now we've kind of flipped from what was a compute bound regime or shape or problem into a, a movement bound or or a memory bound here, these shapes. And uh, it turns out with LM inverts, we're kind of, we're in both of these spots a lot. We're sometimes, sometimes our shapes are like pre-fills, we're like the Q found, and then during decodes, we're very uh, memory bound. And so one way to kind of address this memory bound is, as you can kind of see here, W is, is, is the big block here, right? X and Y are relatively small, and, and W is the, is the really uh, big one here. And this one never changes regardless of our batch size of the single lines. W is always this size. So what people uh, have started to do, and has been quite successful, is to basically say, hey, we don't need to store W full precision. We can actually quantize this down to 4-bit numbers instead of storing them as full 16-bit numbers. Uh, and that will reduce our data movement lower bound, because now what we can see in our total bytes during our computation, we can basically say that each element of W is actually only half a byte instead of two bytes. Uh, so we can see that our data movement lower bound goes from 37 microseconds down to 9 bits. Because uh, now we're only moving four bit values up through that VRAM to L2 bandwidth uh, insulin difference. And uh, this is from a recent blog post that uh, us and Neuromagic actually just recently put out, which shows that you can actually do this quite effectively without like a lot of boss and accuracy. So I'd recommend if you guys are interested, you can check out this blog. Um, but as you can see here in the yellow, that's wait for A16. So that means that we have four bit wakes and 16 bit activations. And as you can see on some um, common metrics we can we can kind of preserve a lot of access. But this does kind of require special gem kernels because you really want to move that data and maintain it in four bit as long as you can. Um, but the tensor cores won't accept a four bit value and a sixteen bit value. So at some point you need to make these match. One option would be to take the activations down to four bit, but then you're introducing more quantization errors. So the typical approach is instead is to take the weights at four bits convert them up to 16 bits uh, and do the computation in 16 bits. Your math is still happy in 16 bits, but your data movement is happy. So what that looks like here is if for a given uh, SM, it's grabbing some slice of W and X, and it's moving them in their current precision all the way up into register. So it's moving the W in 4-bit and the X in 16-bit all the way up into registers. But we can't feed, as I mentioned earlier, we can't feed 4-bit and 16-bit into the tensor cores. It doesn't support that. So instead, we need to do this dequantization in registers from 4-bit to 16-bit. And then we can feed both 16-bit values into the tensor cores and have the computation happen in 16 bits. This looks fairly simple, but in fact, this is actually very, very challenging to get the, this all to happen very efficiently. And so that's what we're here to talk about today, which is Machete, which is a mixed precision gem, which does exactly this, performs the loads in 4-bit and the upconversions but with a bunch of optimizations to make sure that the latency of the upton version is hidden, uh, that the data movement is all happening efficiently in a, in a bunch of things. And so these are kind of all the optimizations that we have using in Machete, and we're going to cover a couple of these today. So the first one's weight pre-shuffling. This is the one we're going to cover in the most depth. It's kind of the most important. 
Then we have interleaved upconverts, which is how we can efficiently upconvert from 4-bit to 16-bit. Uh, we'll also cover this today. Pipelining is just kind of software pipelining. Uh, we won't cover this today. We didn't really have to change that much uh, inside Machete. So Machete was actually built inside of Cutlass, and the idea of doing that was that we can leverage a lot of these optimizations directly from Cutlass for free, close to free. And so the ones labeled here with Cutlass are the ones that we've managed to leverage from Cutlass uh, for free, or we've reused some of their code with some modifications to get it to kind of work. Screen case scheduling we'll cover uh, very briefly, as we also kind of nicely get from Cutlass. And then there's the new Hopper hardware that we really need to get managed up to get full peak throughput on the Hopper DPS, and we'll cover it. And more socialization is another optimization, but we're getting screen case through. So we pre-shuffling, this is kind of the, the most important optimization. Um, but why is it required? What is weight pre-shuffling? What we have here is we have the tensor core layout in registers. And the challenge here, or the, na the name here, you'll see that it says T0, A0, A1. So that means thread zero in registers A0, A1. That's the values is location, like row zero, column zero, and one. Uh, what you'll notice here is that the values for a thread, so this is for thread zero, is actually not like continuous in memory, spread out. And so this layout doesn't lead to kind of efficient data movement from shared memory into registers because you have to do the shuffle uh, to get it from like shared memory into, red, into the appropriate threads registers. And so today for this, for this presentation, what we're going to be working with is kind of a simplified version, 8x8 version of this tensor core layout. It was kind of the fictitious GPU that has 8x8 tensor cores versus the one on the left is a 64 by 16 layout, uh, but that's nearly impossible to visualize. So we're just going to work with this 8x8 one, but you can see that it's very much the same in spirit. So for 16-bit math, which is as uh, like your FP16 gems, what you would normally do is you have here, you have our weight matrix in global memory in 16-bit, row meter, column meter, doesn't really matter, um, but it's in one of those formats. We can then just copy it and kind of wholesale it to shared memory. But then there's actually a special instruction on the GPU that could perform the shuffling of the load matrix instruction. And as you saw there, it's able to, in a single instruction, shuffle the data from shared memory into the appropriate registers. The unfortunate part is that NVIDIA doesn't provide this instruction for load it. It's only available for you. But what ends up happening on 4-bit is if you load this data in row major, when you get into shared memory, now you have to start doing these multiple 8-bit loads of pairs of 4-bit values, as you can see here. We have these 4-bit, uh, four 8-bit loads happening. And the issue with that is, here, we can't maximize this uh, bandwidth without using of wider loads. Uh, so using 8-bit loads will never saturate this bandwidth here. Ideally, we want 128-bit loads, or that's ideally where we want to get to. But before we get there, we're trying to get to 32-bit loads. The basic idea here is that we're actually going to reshuffle the matrix in global memory in, ahead of time, such that all the values that thread cares about are continuous. So what it's going to look like here is that we're actually going to, in global memory, pre-shuffle it. This is going to happen once before inference. Now that I was going to use some memory, now we can kind of do these direct, nice, wide 32-bit loads. Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we actually want to get a whole lift to 128-bit loads. So what we can do here is we can actually grab four instructions worth of data at once. We can shuffle the four instructions and we can interleave them. So now we have four instructions worth of data continuous in memory be loaded all the way up into it. And as you can kind of imagine that that layout is that shuffle is so it's a lot of indexing that is like very, very hard to track. And as the tensor board layouts change. Shuffles change, and as your source matrix changes, and shuffle changes, it's kind of unruly to feel. Um, and Marlin does this pre-shuffling. They were the uh, first ones to do this, so they were doing this pre-shuffling, but it was all man, it was done. So once the new Hopper GVUs came out with new tensor core instructions, you would have to, to adapt Marlin, you have had to repeat this kind of manual a uh, full figuring out what the shuffle should be. So instead, we're leveraging Qt. So what is Qt? So Qt is a way of describing multi-dimensional hierarchical layouts, and have, includes a formal layout. And this is a part of Cutlass. So Qt is implemented as a collection of C++ templates in Cutlass. And it's really awesome. So there's some links there to some talks that I don't know how to recommend you check out. But, um, so in Qt, 
layouts are described as a integer tuple pair of like a shape and a integer tuple for a shape and then an integer tuple for a strike. So here, for example, if you have an eight by eight matrix where the numbers here represent its memory offset or a given location, you can see that the shape of this eight by eight matrix is, is eight comma eight, so it's an integer tuple of eight eight. And in Q, these will be these dimensions will be referred to as modes, uh, so mode zero and mode one. But in the case of this matrix, we're labeling it N for the rows and K for the columns to kind of match our hard gen uh, So the first mode is mode zero is rows and mode one is columns. Now we need to figure out what the strides are. Uh, and so if we look here for the row stride first, we can actually look along one column and see, okay, if we are in one column and we move up by one row, what are we jumping up? It's eight and it's eight again, it's eight again, it's eight again. So here we can see that our row stride is actually eight. And then here, our column stride, if we look along a row, we can see every time we increment a column, what are we jumping by? Here it's one. So this is a, like a row major layout, but in Qt you would describe it using this, this layout here. And then once you have this layout, you could give it a name. It's basically a function at this point. Uh, and so now you can query this function for like a location in the matrix and it will give you the offset in memory. So it's like here, if we queried for three, two, we would get the offset. And then also in Q, they have a way of basically mapping. A, so that layout before would map a multi-dimensional coordinate down to a single offset. But sometimes we also want to go from an index or a one-dimensional offset into a, some kind of higher dimensional coordinate. Because uh, this can prove to be very useful, and you kind of do that with respect to a shape. But here, for example, if we had the shape three four, we want to map a one dimensional coordinate into the shape. We would we can see here uh, we have the indices here, so index zero would map to coordinate zero zero, index seven would map to coordinate one two, and this all kind of seems a bit weird. Uh, and where does this come from? There's more formal definitions, but since this is a presentation, we're going to kind of like figure it out kind of pictorially. But the basic idea here is if you had a column major matrix with that shape, three, four, then uh, it would be, uh, as you can see here on the bottom, we have this column major matrix. Then when you do your index to chord with index, let's say seven for shape three, four, then it's offset seven in this matrix. What's its coordinates? So your agency is two, one, or one, two. This gives you a way of mapping from a one-dimensional coordinate up into some higher dimensional coordinate. And here, for example, if we had uh, index i in the shape 3, 4, then we would get coordinate 0, 3. And so why is this useful? Well, as you can see here, we have a layout where we have rows n and columns k, and uh, we don't have individual offsets in the different locations. We actually have pairs of thread values. As a thread ID and a value ID. And so you probably can't see where we're going here, but if we have a, a layout that maps to a, a one dimensional index, right, we can then use index to chord into a thread value in space here, which is called a major or values. Um, so, for example, here, this layout would index into the thread value space. So the first location would be thread value pairs. Uh, T0, V0, the next one would be T2, V0, the next one would be T4, V0, and so on. And so what you'll see a lot in the cut list and cube code and just generally is, is that in the comments, this will be just kind of treated as one layout. There's like kind of an implicit index to query afterwards. You kind of view this as like a fused layout of like mapping from row column to thread value. So this is how you can have these like multi-dimensional maps. And so in practice, for this specific layout, that's, this is actually what that layout looks like in, in Q. Uh, and you'll notice a few things here is that like, it's a bit more complicated. So it's actually like hierarchical. So the 4-2 actually responds to the n dimension of the rows, 0. And then the 2-2-2 two, 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 actually corresponds to the columns. And this is because this is like too complicated of a layout to be simply um, represented just using one level of a hierarchy. You actually need multiple sub-layouts uh, for, for these different modes to actually get to this complicated layout. So this is where the hierarchical nature of, of Qt comes in. But we don't really need to deal with that because like, Qt handles a lot of this query. So it's, it's very nice uh, to work with. You can just index into the rows and columns. So fine. And kind of ignore the fact that there's some layouts underneath them. 
But for Machete, as we are kind of mentioning, we really want the values that a specific driver cares about to be continuous in memory, right? That's the, that's the pre shuffle That's what we're going for. So we can do these really nice white oats. So here we kind of have our desired way where we have all the thread zeros values, and then we have all the threads one's values, and then all the threads two's values. So we can actually just describe this, the layout from the thread value space, do a specific memory offset, which is this layout M, which is actually just like a row major A by A matrix. Uh, and using Q, we can actually do some really nice things where we can basically say, okay, we had our tensor core layout that told us a row column which thread value it belongs to, and we have our desired layout which says, like, this thread value, this is the offset we want it to be in. We can actually just use composition here to get a layout that maps from row column directly to the memory offset. And that's G here. And this is um, using Q's ability to compose layouts. So what that looks like here is in practice, here we had our original layout F, which maps row columns into uh, thread values. And then we composed it with our M, which is our desired layout. It updates the layout. And now here we can see, now we have a layout to a specific memory offset. And as we can see, this kind of matches our desired one where basically thread zero is zero one, and then we jump over to two, three, uh, and we're still within thread zero. Jump into the next area, thread zero or five, six, seven, and then we move over for thread one. But now we still need to like shuffle from some source matrix, which has some source layout over into this desired layout or our pre-shuffled matrix layout. G is like desired layout and it's our pre-shuffled matrix. So we're given a source matrix layout S, which maps from NK to wherever that, to that source matrix, wherever the, the value lives in memory. Um, what we actually want is we want a mapping from where we want our destination to be, where we want our value to be after shuffling, and then where it should come from source. You could do this backwards. You could go from source to destination. And so you could loop over the source and then write to the destination. Uh, this doesn't, this is not as nice in practice because we're dealing with sub, sub byte values. And you can only do 8 bit writes if you were to take a 4 bit value and then try to do an 8 bit write. You would end up stomping on different parts of memory, causes like a lot of nasty bugs. So instead, we loop over the like, destination so that we can get two 4 bit values, pack them together, and then write them down as one 8 bit value. Uh, so that's why we're, we're trying to go from destination to source. And again, Qt being awesome and amazing, it has functions for, for it doing inverses of layouts, which is very, very useful. So here we can actually just take our pre-shuffled matrix layout, which maps from row column to our memory offset, and we can invert it. So it maps from our memory offset to row column. And we can take that inverted layout, and we can compose it with our source layout, and this just gives us a pre-shuffled kernel. This layout is basically the kernel, because then the kernel just becomes the naive or loop over that destination space and querying the, current, the, the layout for for the source. And so here's some examples of what those layouts end up looking like in practice. Uh, so here, if we had a source layout that's like row major, uh, we get our pre-shuffled kernel layout being this, and then we have a column major, and you can see that it's slightly different. So this gives you a way of like kind of quickly solving for different source, like possible source matrices. Uh, and then it's also kind of built up all using Q layout. So if the tensor port layout changes, you change F, and you can kind of repeat the same process again, and you would get a pre-shuffled kernel. And so then the user flow, uh, kind of in practice in VLM, is basically we load the weights from the checkpoint on disk. We load them into the, the GPU's VRAN. We shuffle them, and then we kind of enter our serving, right? So now you can just kind of use those pre-shuffled plates. You only ever pay that pre-shuffling cost once. Like when the model loads, now you can have your server up for hours or days or whatever you want. And here, just reusing those pre-shuffled. All right, it's pre-shuffled plates, sorry. Uh, so then the next piece is, okay, we have all this data now in registers, and we, we talked about how we could shuffle multiple instructions together, we shuffle them so that we should just officially load all of its values consecutively, but now we need to get them into the test. Yeah, so this is what, after all the loading is done, this is kind of what our registers look like, where the different shades kind of represent different instructions that that value belongs to. So then what happens is here, we now need to shift it over and expand it into 16 bits, pass it over to the tens of voice. So that's the first tensor core instruction, the next tensor core instruction, then the third tensor core instruction, and so on. So here's an example of what that register looks like, the registers look like. So typically in GPUs, registers are 32 bits. 
So here we have our source register, which contains our four bit values. Uh, so we have eight four bit values in our 32 bit register. And they're, uh, the ones that belong to different instructions are colored differently. So the green ones is for our first TensorFlow instruction. And the purple is for the next TensorFlow instruction. Blue is for the one after that. And then yellow is for the last TensorFlow instruction. And then below, we have our destination register, which has a pair of BF16 values or FP16 or whatever they're going out to. Uh, and this is where we ultimately, like, we want to have that BF16 representation of whatever that 4-bit number is at the end. So for this first instruction, the numbers are 4 and 11. And so what we can do is we take our destination register and we can put in some, some magic values uh, here. And so what's magic about these values? Well, that green bit as part of the BF16 is the mantissa. The red bit is exponent and the gray bit is the sign. And so by putting 128 in BF16 into the, the BF16 register, we've kind of aligned it here such that whenever you set the bottom bit, you're going to get 128 plus 1. Whenever you set the second or the bottom bit of the mantissa, you're going to get 128 plus 1. Second last bit, you're going to get 128 plus 2, which aligns the representation of the 4-bit value in binary would be like 1248. It's the same, 1248. So what this means we can do is we can just we can and or uh, those bits into that area of the mantissa, and we end up with a number that's 128 plus whatever that 4-bit number is, whatever that unsigned 4-bit number is. Then you can just do a F, uh, flow you point subtraction of 128, and you get the BF16 representation of that number. So now you have BF16 or in terms of BF16, and you have 11 in the destination register. Uh, and then since we've done this interleaving, since we interleaved multiple instructions together, we have now have this nice property where we can actually just shift this top register by four and we can just kind of repeat the process. And we can get the next instructions data. Uh, but as you can kind of see here, we're going from unsigned orbit up to floating point. The issue is like, we also need negative values um, for storing weights and parameters. There is, there is negative ones. Uh, so what GBTQ and a lot of other algorithms do is that they'll actually store it as an unsigned value with a bias. And so you'll see in the VLM code uh, that we'll have like B8 after some of the different types of machines as like a static bias of eight. And what this means is that instead of storing the exact number that you want to represent, you store that number plus some bias. So for example, here in the purple, the number we're storing is three. We add eight, so we actually store that. Over here, the number we're storing is negative three. Uh, and so we add eight, so the number we actually store is we can then go through the same conversion process, but now when we go to subtract 128, we can actually fuse in the removal of that bias. So we can actually subtract 136 instead. Not actually adding any instructions. We're just changing the constant we subtract. And we can get 3 and minus 3 in BF16. So we can cut, remove this bias, we get negative numbers, and we're not paying any extra costs for that. And then Again, our kind of natural order for this would have been to have all values continuous in memory. Since we're like living in cute worlds, we can have a layout that, that performs as interleaving and we can kind of compose that with the pre-shuffling layout, which gives us the, the pre-shuffling and interleaving. Um, and just to call it call out, we're not the first ones to do interleave. Dr. Timber and Smarlin did this and they kind of got this from faster former and I don't know before that and so on. So another kind of key component of Machete is stream case scheduling, which was originally from a paper uh, by NVIDIA, and then Marlin also does this, and uh, it's been quite widely adopted. And so here, if we have a, a our problem A, B, I'm sorry, the, the name is changing, but the, the assets are a little bit different. So we have green is our, our output, our output C, and we have different tiles here that we need to implement. So a standard kind of a parallel approach here would be to allocate each of those output tiles to a different SM in your GPU. Challenge here is we have four tiles, say, for our output, but we have six SMs. We would end up at 84, and then there's two left eyeball, not fully utilizing the GPU. Uh, so, what StreamK does is it instead says uh, we're just going to kind of like linearize all the work, and then we're going to try to give equal chunks to each SM. Uh, the issue here then is that you end up with um, multiple SMs kind of contributing to the same tile of the output, which requires some synchronization because they each kind of have part of the result for that output and they need to synchronize and then perform this reduction to reduce it down. 
Uh, but it turns out in practice, like having this better workload balance uh, for a lot of cases uh, is better than like uh, offsets the synchronization cost by more than it's cost. So it, it ends up hitting together. And uh, so again, this is, a, this is an area where Machete leverages Cutlass. Uh, so we use the uh, persistent tile scheduler SM Eastern K from Cutlass directly. Since we were built as other Cutlass, um, we can just use this directly, and, and uh, that works uh, pretty well. And then here's some of the links to the reference that I mentioned the paper. And then from our... So then, uh, with Machete, one of the challenges is we also really want to take advantage of the new Hopper. Uh, hardware, and this is just because Marlin was optimized for Ampere, and then once it moves over to Hopper, it can't really beat the peak performance of Hopper because it's not taking advantage of the new hardware, and you really need to take advantage of the new hardware in Hopper to, to reach people. And so the first piece of uh, new hardware that we're going to talk about is the Tensor Memory Accelerator. This is basically a DMA engine, which lets you copy data from global memory up into shared memory back again. And the main idea here is that there's a lot of address computation involved with copying that can kind of clog up your CUDA course. Like we have all these upconverts we all want to do on the CUDA course and other things, so we don't have to spend them doing address computation, that, but that's a win. Uh, and it does the copy asynchronously. Uh, so Machete uses the TMA, it offloads the copying to the TMA, kind of freeing up the CUDA course. And uh, for this, we use the cute TMA abstractions. Uh, we actually uh, used 55, the, the Cutlass example, uh, 55, Hover Mix D-type gem uh, from Cutlass as our starting point. So a lot of this TMA code was already there. So we were able to kind of leverage a lot of that uh, existing Cutlass code, which is really awesome. Oh, and I guess uh, the one note here would be that the, like, the minor complications, the minor changes here is that you need to change the layout you give to the TMA to kind of maximize its box size. So instead of giving it that pre-shuffled layout, we instead kind of give it one that just looks more continuous in memory. Because the other day, uh, we just want to take those four interleaved uh, instructions and copy them as one block. So the TMA doesn't care that it's like interleaved or whatever. All it cares is that it needs to copy this entire block. So the layouts we use uh, for the TMA are slightly different. A pre-shuffled layout. And then the new other uh, hopper some hardware is the WGMMA instructions. Uh, and these are actually really important. So the old MMA matrix multiple instructions um, on Ampere, if you use them on Hopper, you can only get about 63% of peak, or at least that's what the, the hazy research guys uh, found when they were doing Thundercats. Uh, so you really need to use these WGMMA instructions to kind of fully saturate the sensor. These WGMMA instructions differ a little bit in the sense that they're, they operate uh, using 120 threads uh, cooperatively issuing one instruction versus a single warp of 32 threads for the MMA instructions. And then the other minor challenge with WGMA instructions is that it always wants to source D from shared memory uh, for the case of C equals A. Uh, but what we want to compute here is we want to compute our input activations X times W equals Y. And as you can kind of see, W is in the B position. Uh, so instead, we it compute uh, Y transpose equals W transpose X transpose. So that W is now in not in the B position. We can source it from where it's so The last thing we want to do is read in our values, up-convert them, and then have to write them back down to shared memory, because then we'd be kind of really uh, hammering that bus. Uh, so this can be done because we can transpose W during the pre-shuffling kernel, and Y and X we can pass as column major and then uh, to cut list, but then when we pass it back to PyTorch, we can pass it as work major, so we can kind of get that, those transposes for free. That kind of covers everything that uh, I was going to talk about today. Uh, this is just a summary of kind of all the optimizations that kind of went to Machete. And the ones we covered today were like the way pre shuffle We uh, covered the interleaved upconverts uh, pipelining. We did cover today, but it's, it's mostly just software pipeline. Three peak scheduling we covered today. We covered the new hardware. And then there's also work specialization, but there's lots of other blogs and articles about this. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's lots of colleagues' blogs and stuff. So in terms of performance, our main goal was to try to create a kernel that famous speed up in the memory bound case, but didn't cost performance in the compute bound case. Because this was kind of the main challenge with Marlin was it was really performant in the memory bound case, but then in the compute bound case, it would, would struggle. And it turns out like for serving workloads, again, we care about these cases, like pretty, like not exactly woolly, but like generally we care about both of these cases. So a win in one and a loss in the other kind of just nets out to like not being that great. Uh, and so we really want it to be even in one and win in the other or win in both. 
Uh, and so that was the real goal of Machete. And that's what we can see here. So it's like mildly cherry pick shape, but this is a, a 16K by 16K shape here where we can see that uh, it gets FP16 gem. It's, it's kind of in line. It's like a little bit higher just because we kind of change block sizes for the shit. Specific shapes a little bit better. Um, but we can also see in the memory bound region, uh, it performs it performs much better. Uh, it is kind of a similar view here, but kind of highlights uh, where Marlin, as soon as you kind of cross that compute bound regime, uh, your latency, because uh, the y axis is now easier, kind of, so higher is worse. As we kind of cross into that compute bound regime, it kind of really penalizes that that latency, which is what we were really trying to avoid. Whereas with Machete, you kind of get to speed up in the normal bound regime, but then you're not penalized. So it kind of makes it a bit more of a no hard year to recommend versus like uh, it's like, like less dependent. And so then here's some serving metrics uh, that, that we kind of care about. So on the left, we have time to first token. And on the right, we have time for output token. And this is for a Llama 70 v 4 bit on a single uh, H100 using the shared GPT data set. So for example, you might, you might have targets of, of a median uh, time to first token of 250 milliseconds and a, a median of 100 milliseconds per time per output token. As you can kind of see using Machete, you can kind of get up to five user requests per second and still kind of meet these, these metrics, whereas Marlin kind of stops around three. Like you got, you're, you're no longer hitting your targets anymore. Shows why compute bound areas are still, still important to optimize. Uh, similarly, same kind of graphs, but this is for a lot of 405p or bet on four H100s. And here you can see that like using those kind of same targets and trunk PFIL, we could serve maybe uh, three user requests per second reasonably hit those targets with the machete, whereas with Marlin, this kind of explodes once it kind of gets under load. If they're spending more time in that rebound regime once they're under load, and it, it just can't keep up anymore. Yeah, so that's everything I had prepared for today. Uh, so if anybody has any questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Great, great talk and really cool technology. I'm curious um, why the 4-bit weights and 16-bit computation instead of like 8-bit weights and 8-bit computation, especially since you're targeting Hopper in particular, and the tensor cores should be able to handle 8-bit computation natively. Yeah, so I think there's still definitely a space for 8-bit for weights and 8-bit computation. I would say, like, you can't fit a Llama 405B using 8-bit weights into 4-800s. Uh, so there is, like, definitely regimes and things where, like, one of these is, like, 4-bit weights is the, is the only possibility. Uh, so if you're really, you're really trying, because we were talking all about performance here, but the, the other kind of axis here is like fitting onto the, actually fitting onto the GPU. And this is kind of where 4-bit weights like really, really shine because you're also lowering the amount of VRAM you actually need. And so I would generally probably say like, I mean, it depends on your workload. So you can like obviously talk to us in Neuromagic, like questions about this. I don't want to like give any kind of broad rules of them, but generally like, if you can run FPA and it kind of makes sense, then it's not a bad thing to use. So we're not saying that this is like the end all be all and like this is exactly what you should be using in all situations, but there are situations where for it is. Got it. Uh, and then what about like up converting to the to 8-bit instead of 16-bit and then doing the calculations there? Could, wouldn't you get the best of both worlds? Yeah, so this is something that we are to looking into to a degree. There's some, there's some big kind of challenges here, uh, specifically around group scaling, things like this. Uh, as you, like, because normally we didn't touch on it, but you have group scales to make the accuracy not be penalized too much here. Uh, but to apply both scales, you need 16-bit math, and the only 8-bit math right now is in the tensor cores. So you wouldn't want to use tensor cores to do that scaling. You'd want to use CUDA cores, and CUDA cores don't support FP8. There's, like, ways we're kind of thinking around this. There's like things we can do. There's, but it's a bit more of a, it's a bit more of like a research topic right now than, than like a production ready, uh, ready thing. So I think, yes, you're right. This is something that we're very interested in and kind of a compelling direction, but there's some unique challenges to that specific setup that need to still be addressed. You already have like some like W4A kernels like started to be integrated. Yeah. So there is, there is like uh there was QQQ, which they merged in a, implementation, but the way this works is you basically go from 4-bit weights up to 16-bit, you apply the scales and then you drop back down to 8-bit. Uh, this kind of chokes you in the compute bound regime. Uh, so we're trying to look at ways of doing this. So like, yes, there is some code in there already. There is things you can play with, but we would say like, it's not really super optimal or performant yet, and that's kind of something we're kind of pushing towards. But I think it's a very interesting uh, area of research. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, feel free to type them in or. Yeah. Um, one other question, like that, the layout for the NMA instruction is pretty weird, right? Like, do you have any intuition for why it's that layout? Is it like bank conflict within the register file or something else? Yeah, that might be a, a question better targeted for the NVIDIA guys, but it does seem like, like there is multiple versions of this, uh, like different shapes of these tensor core instructions that you can issue. And so if you were to do like, um, you kind of want to be able to tile it out so you can kind of get all these shapes without the layout changing that much, right? So if you were kind of doing like row major and then all of a sudden you started extending that dimension out and whatever, like, right, some specific thread would be responsible for would kind of change. Whereas uh, if you're kind of using these these weird layouts that I think you kind of like scale to these different chips a bit more easily. That's my speculation. I'm not an NVIDIA or engineer. I don't know exactly where it's all keep from. Just, no, we need to deal with it. Uh, yeah, there's a question in the comments, just on any chance this will work on ADA, or is it just Hopper? Obviously, yeah. Yeah, this is just Hopper, because uh, we use the TMA and the WGM instructions. Uh, that being said, I think Marlin, like, we kind of thought about this, like, do, do we want to, like, write Marlin using Cutlet Cute and things like this? But Marlin is, like, very well-optimized for these sorts of uh, GPUs and stuff. So, like, on Ampere and stuff, Marlin is still very, very good, so... I think you can just use that and kind of be fine with it. It was really, it was really on top of that started to struggle. And then also going forward, we needed a better plan of attack for being able to like quickly get these kind of curls out for the next generations in a way that doesn't require so much manual indexing. And like it should be like applicable to future architectures though. Like, or at least the yeah, next generation. Uh, yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it doesn't change around the, the hardware like dramatically like TMA something go away. What do we do? Yeah, please just lay on something. Yeah. I mean, that is... I guess on that front, the Hopper architecture has the special SM90A flag in compilation, which says, like, I'm willing to use features that might not be supported in future GPUs. Do you have, like, I'm actually not familiar with WGMMA and the TMA acceleration, whether those are, like, regular SM90 or whether those are SM90A. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're SM90A, uh, so they may, they, there is a chance they... They go away, but I imagine they will probably be. Um, and I assuming that Cutlass will also support them. And then since they were built, built inside of Cutlass, adopting those new features should be a lot easier and hopefully more straightforward. But I mean, that all kind of remains to be seen. So yeah, at this point, it's all kind of speculation. But our, our view was that by using the kind of cute layouts and being inside of Cutlass, we're the best position we can be to, to get as much of a jump start as we can. Exactly. Um, any other questions for folks? Um, question about the stream K scheduling that you mentioned is like, when is that the right strategy to use? Is there like a particular matrix shape or particular like scale matrix in which that wins out over like simpler scheduling? Is it like super wide matrices or just like really big ones? Yeah. I would say, like, generally, if you're, if it's, like, small matrices, stream cake is, like, really nice. Like, the example I showed is when, like, you can't, when you're doing data parallel, you can't fully saturate the SMs. But once you kind of do your decomposition, you don't actually have enough work for all the SMs, and that you find that stream care really kind of shines in these cases. There's also other cases when, like, the way your work ends up dividing out, you maybe have, like, one full wave of work, and then the next wave is, like, a half wave. That can also be a case. So it is, like, it is very shape-dependent. That being said, we find that stream cake can be at least like the Marlin implementation stream cake can be can be quite performant in in a lot of cases, um, and so we like really like that. Uh, there is some heuristics in the Cutlass stream cake implementation that we are kind of playing around with because it kind of supports both data parallel and stream cake switches between them. Uh, there's some we're kind of playing around some of those heuristics, and I think there's like a little bit we squeeze there because I think there is some cases where it's using data parallel, but stream cake might be better. And there's there's some other tweaks there. I would say like there's still a little bit a little bit of work to be done on that. 